Today is Wednesday, June the 13th, 2012. I'm Matthew T.G. I'm Heath Mulliken. I'm Steve Stanley. And I'm Tony Casey. Welcome to The Technology Show, a weekly podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. This is episode 159. And this episode is brought to you by Southern Wesleyan University. At Southern Wesleyan University, it's not just about getting ahead, it's about going beyond. And Southern Wesleyan University has been taking students beyond their dreams to their real potential for more than 100 years. So whatever your dreams, wherever you want to go, Southern Wesleyan University can take you farther. To learn more about how Southern Wesleyan University takes you farther, visit swu.edu. And make sure they send you a copy of the new SWU magazine where on page 20, the Techology Show <laughs> is featured. Shameless plug there. <laughs> All right. So how are we doing, guys? Have we recovered from the general conference? No, we have not. All right. It, st- it didn't take anything out of me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like her. I, you understand. Um, so it's, we need to issue some huge thanks here. Oh, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Heath. Just, just issue uh, We want to thank you know Southern Wesleyan University. Kingswood University, uh, Wesley Seminary at Indiana Wesley University, and Oklahoma Wesleyan University for being uh, great sponsors. We also had some individuals who who made donations to the show to make our trip to General Conference possible. We want to thank everybody. I mean, we have gotten calls and letters from uh, not really, but we've got <laughs> we've gotten messages. We've from had emails. Lots of great. We've got messages literally from all yeah. over the world. People thanking us, and it was our honor. I mean, it was great well, to do. And, and big thanks to the jury guys. Yes, uh, Keith Jury, David Jury, Stevan Sheets. Yes, was, Stevan. Oh my, he word. just did fantastic. I, I don't think words can describe the amount of effort that many, many maybe didn't even notice, but like. Steven's got some new wrinkle lines in his forehead yeah. from just so intensely listening yes. to what was happening and taking notes on yeah. what was going on on the conference floor. Just did a fantastic job. And, and also, you know, none none of this would have been possible without the Department of Communications live streaming uh, the events of General Conference, and they were great to, to work with and actually were kind enough to interview us. And uh, that's on their YouTube page at Wesley. Hey, I, and I saw the interview. You guys didn't even give me a shout out. Thanks a lot. Listen, man. That, you didn't, you, I, we, I, hey, shout out for shout out. And here was the deal: when you took the floor of yes, the conference, instead right. of saying, instead of saying, "This is I'm Tony Casey from South Carolina District," yeah. we wanted you to get up and say, yeah, you're "This right. is Tony Casey from you the Technology it. Show." Had you given us a shout out, we might yeah. have considered doing the same okay. for you. And Heath, shall shall we not thank uh, the master controller over here to my right? Matthew? Oh, TG, oh my word! I mean, his 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 he was glued he was. to that chair from morning till night. I mean, he's yeah. pulling like sixteen hour <laughs> shifts, man. Yeah, we we would we were getting over to the to the exhibit hall about seven and weren't leaving there till about eleven and just a lot of hours put in and. And it was a it was a dream come true for us, uh, Matthew. I think in the interview with the communications department, you pointed out that there were more Wesleyans that were there virtually yep. than to, physically. Than, yeah, there than were physically. Yep. There were there were there were, I mean, over over the course of time, not not everybody was there for the entire live stream right. of everything, but more people came in and out of general conference and in and out of the exhibit hall and in and out of the conference floor virtually. Than we're physically on location, and that's that's tremendous. That's yeah. huge for for the church, and it's great that we can do that thing. Yeah. And, and just on our website, had probably over ten thousand hits during during that time frame of general conference. So there's no telling how many sites, I mean, how many hits they got. It was, uh, it was well. Great. We know we know that the first not not Saturday, but Monday, the first full day of conference delegation we did get the report from wayne and they had close to 1500 people that yeah. day yeah uh 1500 unique individuals yeah. tune in to what was happening and then we had you know a bunch more to add to that so it's just cra- it's crazy that was yeah. great good stuff um we were advertising and pumping the giveaway of a discovering evangelical heritage we yes. got that book signed by uh donald dayton and yes. so at the end of the show we will announce our winner. We have the winner has been chosen. All righty, and at this point, it is uh, just an honor to have with us uh, Joe Donjel. Joe was born into a pastor's home near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in 1956. As a child of the Wesleyan Holiness Movement, he early became acquainted with revivals and camp meetings, along with the messages they urged. 
Joe remembers praying as a young boy to receive Jesus on a Sunday night in his bedroom with his parents beside him. Joe's a 1978 graduate of Southern Wesleyan University, where he majored in Greek. In 1981, he finished at Asbury Theological Seminary with a Master of Divinity with concentration in the area of biblical studies. 1986, he earned a master's degree in classical literature from the University of Kentucky. In 1991, Joe received his Ph.D. from Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. He serves as a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary within the Biblical Studies Department. He's an ordained minister in the Wesleyan Church. He currently serves on the boards of Southern Wesleyan University and the Francis Asbury Society. He's the author of John, a Bible commentary in the Wesleyan tradition, and Why I'm Not a Calvinist, co-authored with Dr. Jerry Walls. Joe has been married to Regina Lane Dongel for over 30 years, and together they are the parents of twins Jordan and Jana. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, um... So this, this whole interview came about uh, through uh, a conversation with a mutual friend of ours, uh, Buddy Rampey, our district superintendent. And um, he told me that recently you have been uh, studying uh, Wesley primarily and began to just talk to him about some of your insights in terms of holiness, uh, sanctification, uh, the work of the Spirit, and the life of the believer. I was fascinated by just the stuff that he was saying, and so... Um, we have invited you on today, and, and this is a little bit different because usually, you know, we have an author or someone like that. We've read their material or we've heard stuff they've had to say, but this is truly an interview where we're looking for you to inform us. I mean, for all of us here, we're ordained Wesleyan ministers. Our interest for Wesley is high. Um, the influence of Wesley in our movement, you can see it in the name. And so tell us a little bit, kind of the journey here and, and some of the insights that um, you have uh, unearthed since you started down this journey. Yeah, it's actually very good that you use the word journey because that, that's truly what it's been for me. I didn't, I didn't expect this journey. I didn't look for it. And in a sense, I didn't want it. Um, let me start with, uh, say, the 1995 um, uh, addressed by Keith Drury, kind of famous now, the yeah. Wesleyan Holiness Movement is dead. Yeah, and uh, and uh, a great deal of discussion generated out of that. Uh, he was, I think, just telling the truth that we're we're small now, very narrow, tend to be ingrown, tend to be basically irrelevant. And uh, he offered a variety of reasons. Among most of them were sociological, um, our lack of attentiveness, uh, failure to uh, capture lay people, um, failure to communicate well. Um, he knocks on the church growth movement. He also uh, addresses the problem of that's been discussed repeatedly, and that is that people in the ranks of Christians who actually haven't been converted, all sorts of things uh, that he lays out, and I think many of them have a very good insight to them. But but the, uh, the underlying assumption throughout the document and throughout the discussion that has followed to me seems to be something like this the message itself or i should say the core the core content is just fine uh what we're messing up on is the delivery the communication and the actual real life follow through of it that that tends to be what what i've heard for many many years um i have to admit that the doctrine of entire sanctification for me has been largely problematic uh, partly because I'm a biblical scholar and I'm always looking to find how does this how does this rooted in scripture beyond the very general themes you know be holy obey God right. give him your whole self how does it end up that that uh, that this that this doctrine is anchored in, in, in scripture in a way that's clearly convincing and I found myself disappointed over and over again at that connection. And so I've been a tentative uh, agreeer with uh, the doctrine, you might say, uh, but but on the sidelines quite a bit. But uh, more recently, some things have been happening in my own uh, thinking, heart, life, you know, however you want to put it. Sure. Mm. And I've been finding myself... Um, kind of hungry to get a bearing on on this whole business because 
it certainly is a huge part of our heritage. Right. And it seems to me the church is, in my impression, kind of moving away generally from it. We're moving more towards becoming a, uh, 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 an evangelical operation with occasional references to entire sanctification. And when we do mention yeah. entire sanctification, we define it and redefine it in such generalized ways that so long as anybody makes a reference to some kind of a deeper encounter with God of any sort, we say, okay, that counts, great, you're in. Okay, now let's forget about that and let's get on to discipleship, yeah. worship, evangelism, uh, helping with the poor, et cetera, et cetera. So it just has seemed to me that the whole thing is is has got very, very short time left. And personally, I don't have an interest in recovering that. I'm not a re recovery guy where, oh, we got to get back and we got to recover our roots. I'm more of a biblical guy. Plus, I'm a, I'm a what is really true guy. Yeah. That's really what was driving me. And so, let me get right to the point here. Um, I began doing my own reading in Wesley for some weird reason, because uh, <laughs> that's not my field. And I got to admit, I'm, I'm just, not, I, I never felt temperamentally drawn to the man. Hmm. Um, he was always quoted in, in you might say, heavy duty machinery explanation of entire sanctification. You know. The secondness of it, the instantaneousness of it, uh, uh, the, the nature of inbred sin, uh, difference between sins and sin, the definition, it just get, got to be kind of a tiresome exercise in a kind of lower level, uh, not interesting to me, uh, form of systematic theology. And so Wesley was never quite the guru that was the shining light that I was always headed towards. Uh, but uh, a mistake was made uh, by someone. Uh, they gave me a beautiful edition of uh, of um, a plain account of yeah. Christian perfection, yeah. and I thought I, it, it lay on my shelf for a while. And I thought, you know, I'd better look at this. Be able to say I read it. Now, <laughs> I had read it at one time before, but you know, just sort of cruising through it, it seemed to be the same old Wesley stuff. You know, same old argumentation minutia, debate, uh, yeah. and so I went, I read through the whole thing, and I read it again, and then I read it again, and something began to dawn on me that was actually quite a shock, and I'll just put it this way, the Wesley that I knew through the Wesley and Holiness quotations, to me now, does not appear to be the Wesley himself. And a distance began to emerge between the, um, you might say, the Wesleyan holiness doctrinal formula and Wesley's own vision of the Christian life. Okay. And I went back and I read more. I actually began to create an index in the back of, of this little book, my own hand index. Uh, Ooh. Ooh. Um, that Wesley has a center of his theology, and he has a vision of God that, that powers everything. And the surprise to me was that the word holy or holiness is not the best description of Wesley's burden, but rather love. Mm. Love. Yeah. Now, um, I'll just tell you immediately, I this was a startling thing to me because I had heard love mentioned only in passing. It is, it shows up here and there in doctrinal statements of entire sanctification that you find published here and there. Um, but it's, it's, it's rare, it, it's almost a throwaway line. It's almost a, a dead end in itself or simply a description of who people are supposed to be uh, once all of this has happened. And what I wasn't prepared for was the, the, uh, the absolutely pervasive uh, controlling function of love in Wesley's theology. Um, that was sort of stage one. My reaction to that was, well, maybe I've read Wesley wrong. You know, maybe, maybe I'm just being selective here. And so I began to do a survey of... Um, theologies of Wesley, and then begin to do more reading in Wesley himself. I 
uh, I did a skimming of all the titles of articles in the Wesleyan Theological Journal over these 30 years or more. Mm -hmm. um, I did a survey of a whole series of, of, let's say, recent theologies of Wesley and so forth. Then I had some conversations with, I think, some pretty well-reputed Wesleyan scholars and came to conclude I was not going crazy. <laughs> that, in fact, Wesley centered everything in love in a in, in a very substantial way. It's a st substantial way, not accidental, tertiary, what have you. Um, my next my next sort of thought was, I'm, I'm not sure I like that, because love has never seemed to me to be a very stable, definable, meaningful theological category. It's something that everybody agrees with. We all would nod to it, um, but we don't. We can't measure it. We don't know what right. to do with it. Yep. Um, it doesn't seem to have substance in and of itself. And then, um, quickly, one will discover that a whole series of questionable theologies claim love as their center point. So, for example, classic liberalism is all all about the love of God. Yep. I'm not a liberal, so. Uh, I had an immediate turnoff to the notion of love. Second, um, um, let's say universalism jumps smack on to love. Yeah, because of God's love, da 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 da. I'm not a universalist, so I'm not quite interested, and I'm kind of afraid of this love stuff. Third, love is unbearably sentimental in most of my acquaintance with uh, conversations about it. Uh, sentimental, undefinable then love has become really a kind of a calling card for process theology. And I'd make mention in the Nazarene Church, um, Thomas Ord is really pushing love slash process theology. I can't go down the road of process theology. I don't think it is, is fundamentally sound in the, in, the, in the final analysis. And so, but, but yet, love and process theology are pretty closely wedded. Then toss another one in. Uh, open theism. Now, yeah. I don't happen to think that open theism is a, a heresy, uh, but I'm not quite there to open theism. Um, I'm, I'm more of a classical theist, as they would describe it. Uh, and so, basically, a whole series of folk have taken love as their focus, and I'm not going down those roads, so why should I embrace love? Well, what that got me to doing was to basically be exploring a whole the whole business of love and I tell you guys I went down I went way over my head I was not aware of how deep and profound and how and what a what a what a fertile topic this has been through church history uh, all of the major theological figures I can think of have had a major say in what in the world love is hmm. and how in the world love functions. Um, but um, there's no way for me to sort of summarize that, that discussion or that research. Let me get back to the business of the Wesleyan Holiness Movement and, and Wesley himself, because I think this is, this is pretty important here. Um, it seems to me that the seeds of the demise of Wesley's message were already sown in the way the doctrine was reformulated as it crossed the Atlantic uh, over into North America. Yeah. In other words, we talk of, our, of ourselves as being small, narrow, ingrown, and irrelevant. To me, it has to do with giving up on Wesley's own central insight. Ironically, while we advertise ourselves as the true heirs of Wesley. And I just want kind of want to make a claim here, and that is that we have fumbled the ball away entirely on what he envisioned to be the center of all spirituality and all religion. Uh, this is what uh, Plain Account really shocked me about, and I just, uh, I know this is dangerous to read something on air, but I want to do this because there are there are probably ten passages in plain account where it seems to me Wesley is standing on his head to make the point that it, it, is, it is really all about love. Um, 
And let me let me read one one of the passages that All has right. become my favorite here. And in my little uh, version of uh, Plain Account, it's on page 102. Um, the cause of a number, the cause of a thousand mistakes, is this: not considering deeply enough that love is the highest gift of God, humble, gentle, patient love, and all visions, revelations, manifestations, whatever are little things compared to love, and that all the gifts are either the same with or infinitely inferior to it. If uh, it were well that you should be thoroughly sensible of this, the heaven of heavens is love. There is nothing higher in religion. There is, in effect, nothing else. Mm. If you look for anything but more love, you were looking wide of the mark. You are getting out of the royal way. When you are asking others, have you received this or that blessing? If you mean anything but more love, you mean wrong. You are leading them out of the way, putting them upon a false scent. Settle it in your heart, then, that from the moment God has saved you from sin, you are to aim at nothing more but more of that love described in the 13th chapter of Corinthians. You can go no higher than this till you are carried into Abram's bosom. Joe. I could go on and on with, with those kind of quotes. And then, uh, Tony, I heard you kind of bump in there. Yeah. Just Let me just finish this right go ahead. here. Go ahead. And say this, that over and over again, and, and there are too many to document. Well, here's my little index. I don't know if you... <laughs> There's my index, oh. <laughs> and it's the index of love references in plain account. And over and over again, Wesley is asked, what is the essence of what you're talking about? What is this doctrine all about? And he would say this. He'd say, it is nothing other than the greatest commandment as described by Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, yeah. mind, and strength, yeah. and your neighbor as yourself. Over and over and over again, he said that. That was the summary. That was the essence. I have looked through my whole shelf of Wesleyan Holiness books, and I find either nearly no reference to love, or if it is referenced, a, a few pages here or there, but no theological or meaningful practical linkage from that into what has become the, the formula of baptism of the Spirit, uh, subsequent salvation entered into, entered into by faith in a moment of full surrender in which original sin is rooted out and we are filled with the Holy Spirit's empowering for full service. Uh, that, that has, now what has happened is that purity, which is a subtractive notion, and empowerment have become the two foci of what we're calling entire sanctification. And Wesley's Wesley's vision really uses a different vocabulary, a different concept. He does not begin with the holiness of God. He begins with the love of God, which means that becoming like God is primarily become a person of overflowing, outgoing love. Mm. There's the seed that we've lost. And wow. once we miss that, then I think that the passion to become not sinning the passion to become not disobedient mm. actually is a negative flow that focuses everything upon my own state of whether I'm holy. Wesley's vision mm. and Wesley's question was, have you become filled with love? And, the f and being filled with love wow. has to do with the overflow that reaches out to other people in a passionate embrace mm. out there. Yeah. And I think that here, right there, that, that's that's why we're we're a movement that's dying and dead. Wow. It's because it's not because we need to relanguage it. It's not because we need simply to believe it more. Mm. It's because mm. I think we have grabbed the thing by the wrong handle. Mm. Mm. And we have gotten the thing reversed, turned around, and one eighty mm. from where it's headed. Um, but I'll stop here, take a breath, and let you guys well, chime in. Here, here's a question I want us to chew on, um, and after our uh, commercial break here, we'll get back to it. Here's the question 
So in my mind, as I hear you talk, here's what pops in my brain. So if we're not heirs of Wesley in our movement, um, then who are we heirs to or of? Um, I mean, I've got my own thoughts about that. I'm sure all of us could do. And, and um, you know, maybe we'll just kind of have a roundtable about that. But uh, for a moment here, we want you to hear a word from our sponsor. Right. Um, I'm going to throw this over to Heath. Heath, there's a question in the chat room, so let's grab that real quick. Yeah, Joe, one of the questions in the chat room was, uh, how do you explain to, to people who do, are not from a Wesleyan tradition, how do you explain uh, holiness and sanctification in layman's terms to people who have not used that type of language before? Yeah, I'm not even sure I would start with that language. I really wouldn't. Uh, I don't think that's where Wesley's pointer is. Uh, Wesley's pointer would be to love, yeah. and he would right. ask this: Why? Why do we discover? Why do we discover that we are not truly loving people? Why? How is it that we find ourselves as Christians and yet uh, hesitant, resistant to love? We don't embrace people, or else we do that in a very selective way. Mm. And I think that the answer to that has to do not, and here's where our answer usually is, our answer usually is to appeal to the will and to give people information. That is mm. to tell them that they should be loving okay. yeah. and then to tell them to get busy at it. Yeah. Uh, that's what we, we tell people to do. And so it's all a business of motivational, informational urging. We address the will and we tell people to get on with it. Um, I think the deal is, and Wesley's, um, apart from the Matthew 22 passage, where Wesley would, which Wesley would quote over and over again, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice all of those three loves, all three of them, to be loving God, to be loving neighbor, and by implication, to be loving ourselves. Those are outflow loves. They go out from us. Mm. The question is, wow. the question is, where does that love come yeah. from? Yep. Where does the love come from? And here is where I think uh, uh, another huge shift is to shift from Wesley's focus on the Gospel of Matthew and 1 John to the book of Acts. Because when we leave 1 John, we leave a key insight about love. Uh, love is ek tutheu, from God from God, which means that the outflow of our loves to God, others, and to ourselves, the outflow of those loves can only take place when there is an inflow of love from God to me in the deepest part of my heart, yeah. which leads to the Romans 5.5, 5, which is also another frequently mentioned verse. The Holy Spirit pours out into our hearts, sheds abroad in our hearts the love of God, meaning that, meaning that the, the deficit of our output can be addressed by mm. uh, exploring the deficit of the inflow. Yeah. And the deficit it's of the inflow true. is the only way to get to the outflow. And um, that inflow is an inflow of love and... Uh, and I would say that the greatest exposition of that mm. is the, uh, the third chapter of Ephesians, where um, Paul has a prayer. He has a prayer. It's for believers, Ephesians written to believers. Mm. It's his prayer there uh, from 314 to 319 uh, that they not just be empowered and indwelt, 
But the whole thing leads to the crescendo of that prayer, that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Yeah. In other words, everybody who signs up for the faith, every Christian has signed up for God's love. Every Christian has checked yes on the box. Yeah, God loves me. I know that. I accept that. And I believe that. But the implication of that prayer in Ephesians 3 is that that deepest realization and reception of God's love for me so that I become beloved and I know I'm beloved and I am overflowed with and overflowing with God's love to me and for me. Once that happens, then you can have the living that is called for in Ephesians 4 through 6. Yeah. You can, as a beloved person, I do these things. And we've got a very serious theological problem and praxis problem, I think, in which we want people to behave in loving ways. But, we, but they have not come to the deeper inflow of, of, the, of the full uh, being embraced by God and God's love. Yeah, Joe, I mean, Ephesians, the rest of Ephesians um, um, 4 through 6 doesn't make sense outside of, of uh, Ephesians 3. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that when, he, when the question was asked out of the chat room, you said you wouldn't even start there. Um, Earl Wilson, I heard him the last decade of you know his ministry, the denomination, in his book, We Hold These Truths, and I heard him at a holiness conference. He said that um, it was of his, just his opinion that we just need to abandon the language altogether, that it's become so bogged down. Um, and the language he means um, sanctification, entire sanctification, that, that so many layers have been put on this. Um, you know, I asked the question before the, the break here, um, so, so in terms of the holiness tradition, to whom are we heirs? Um, I, I'm curious your thoughts here. I've often said that I believe that we're heirs of Phoebe Palmer, not Wesley. Um, just in your opinion, am I close here? I completely agree with that. Yeah. I think that what Palmer did was she, she, didn't, she not only Americanized uh, the doctrine, I think she pragmatized it. There isn't a word I just invented. There you go. Uh, <laughs> now, now, now you've proved you are a true educator, Joe. <laughs> there you go. I guess that should appear in some dictionary now. Uh -huh. but here, here's what... Here's, um, there are so many differences between the doctrine as, as it's come to be congealed in the Wesleyan Holiness Movement and Wesley's vision of it. It's stunning to me. Stunning. In fact, they use Wesley's words and misunderstand Wesley's own idea. Yeah, it's it's a shocking to me. It's a shocking miscarriage of Wesley. So, for example, to be received by faith in one moment of full surrender. That is very far from Wesley, as as I understand it now. Uh, the the Palmer the Palmer formula was based on uh, a verse in Matthew twenty two in which Jesus, in an argument, made a comment that the altar sanctifies yeah, the gift. Right. Yeah. And so what she said was, oh, I see a spiritual principle there that explains how to get it entirely sanctified, and that is that if I put myself as a gift on the altar, then it is sanctified. I am sanctified. And then what we've done is we've said, okay, since we believe that God does this immediately upon us meeting that condition of full consecration in a, in a mixed with faith, then what we say then is that if you have fully consecrated yourself to God, you are in fact entirely sanctified. Nothing of the sort was Wesley's vision. In fact, uh, and and then and then furthermore, uh, Palmer and others, and then the whole Wesleyan movement quoted Wesley over and over again about it being an instantaneous work, quoted Wesley, he, and Wesley said, in fact, uh, expect it now, expect it now. It is instantaneous. It is instantaneous. Expect it now. What Wesley meant by that was completely other than what the Wesleyan yeah. Holiness Movement took it to be. Yeah. They took it to mean that you can, in fact, get it now at an altar of prayer, if you surrender yourself entirely, and you can know it happened right then because you've consecrated yourself, 
And on God's word, Matthew 22, we know that, the, that a gift on the altar gets sanctified immediately by God. Now, what Wesley meant by now, he said, notice, expect it now. He did not say claim it now. Yeah, yeah. Wesley never had a kind of uh, you you can you can claim this and you can knowingly get it right now tonight. In fact, the last page of Wesley's plain account, he has. Um, let me read this to you as well. He has these final reflections. Um, notice final reflections of Wesley. These are near the end. 1767, this is after he's been preaching for decades. As to time, I believe this instant generally is the instant of death, the moment before the soul leaves the body. But I, may, but I believe it may be 10, 20, or 40 years before. He goes on to say, I believe it is usually many years after justification, but it may be within five years or five months. I know no conclusive argument to the contrary. Notice this last comment. And how many days or months or even years can one allow to be between perfection and death? Uh, and how near to death? Ends with a question mark. In other words, we have made entire sanctification sort of the prerequisite for even being ordained. We've made it the prerequisite to being fully inside the camp. Wesley's view was never that way. So why was it that in Wesley's view, this may happen 5, 10, 15, 20 years later? Was it because people had not fully consecrated themselves to God? No. It was because in Wesley's view, the business of when this happens is completely God's doing. And so I do think that the message has been seriously distorted mm. here on this side of the, of the pond <laughs> and that we have fumbled the ball on love and I, I am believing more and more firmly that we need to uh, we don't need to change we don't, we don't need a language change we don't need better better expression we have missed the substance of oh, it wow. <laughs> it is a substance wow. question wow. I don't want to relanguage this it's not a matter that we need to change the vocabulary or get more adequate terminology it has we have we have traded Wesley's substance for a different substance and that substance by it, it, that substance inevitably has a downward inward narrowing restricting a life that it creates sorry to say that i'm saying this with a lot of pain <laughs> yeah yeah because i was raised in this whole thing. sure um i i had the opportunity to sit under dr melvin dieter for a class at asbury he came and taught it while i was there and um another thing he talks about phoebe palmer is how she took a knowledge and equated that with conviction you know mm. oh you know I mean, if you, you cognitively know, well, then that is conviction, which then led to this whole instantaneous thing, the altar theology, just come down here, the altar sanctifies the gift. And so there is this huge shift, um, as, as you have well noted, with Phoebe Palmer. And, um, and, and so, again, we, we're not direct heirs of Wesley, we're direct heirs of, of Phoebe Palmer, but we, you know, uh, we don't see that and... and, and a lot of times that gets lost. Um, during the commercial break, Steve, you, you, you were, and I were talking a little bit, and you talked about um, even with the working out of holiness and the importance of the class meetings and things of this nature, the bands with Wesley. Um, you know, what was the point there? That well, I just want to affirm what Dr. Dongelis said to this point. Um, uh, first of all, especially these last points that in our movement this has tended to be an individualistic experience um, yeah. that led very quickly to moralistic comparisons mm. among ourselves and who was more holy based on what could yeah. be visually observed which Wesley's focus is on the heart first he said at one point that uh, we're, we're continually forgetting that it's inward holiness that produces all outward holiness and the inward holiness is loving God but the class meeting, he also said that without the preservation of the class meeting, 
this social interaction of not judging. Um, I, I, I think that probably it's going to be difficult for people who have no experience with the term or the concept to understand that this is, this is not um, a judging or a, a shooting carp in a rain barrel or any term that you want to, you know, you get pin the tail on the donkey. Well, you're not perfect. You're not perfect. It was it was a time of mutual edification. Uh, in E. Stanley Jones's book, A Song of Ascents, he has a <clears throat> a place in there where he talks about an experience in his own life where he almost fell into outbroken sin, and he talks about how devastating that was to him spiritually and he went that night to his class meeting which was led by a man named John Zink and in those two pages where he talks about this he talks about the fact that he was that close to forever being lost to the kingdom of God but these men without judgment without condemnation with every intention of helping and nurturing and reconnecting him his own words lifted me back to the bosom of god and and i wonder if if there isn't some part of our movement uh and and i'm really glad to see that asbury is relaunching the concept of um, of class meetings for uh, mentoring mm. groups too yeah. i saw that on your seedbed site after tony mentioned that but i'm wondering if there isn't some aspect here you mentioned the word uh, uh, uh for for this ingressive kind of holiness wesley was against enthusiasm because it was it was always kind of inwardly focused. It was fanaticism. It was a display of self. But is there not a place, uh, and could this not be one way to begin a conversation about real uh, Christian perfection? This coming to a place of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in your neighbors, yourself, and being of use to one another. Could that conversation not begin again in uh, uh, some kind of reformulation of class meetings where our real authentic selves are brought forward into the presence of uh, brothers with brothers, sisters with sisters, and we we help lift one another back to the bosom okay, of God. Okay, Joe, yeah, Joe, I'd love to hear you respond to that. Uh, before you do, though, let's hear another word from Southern Westland University. Renew. Reuse. Rejoice. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Hebrews 13, 7 and 8. You know, it's not often that we are given the opportunity to simultaneously relish the past and feed the future. But today, we have exactly that opportunity. Two great sons of Southern Wesleyan University, Dr. Virgil Mitchell and Dr. Roy Nicholson, our distinguished alumni of the century, did more to nourish the Wesleyan way of life than any two others that we know. They tilled the land and sowed the seeds of faith, compassion, and education throughout our community, our state, and our world. Now it's our turn to tend those fields and renew the cycle again. As our congregation of Alive Wesleyan Church prepares to move to a new location, Southern Wesleyan University is launching a campaign to purchase the building we're leaving in the heart of this campus. With your help and with God's infinite grace, the facility will become the Nicholson Mitchell Christian Ministry Center, where a new generation of young people will prepare to carry God's word into the world, that no one shall hunger for the truth. A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. Proverbs 18, 16. To learn more about how you can help tend the garden that will feed our future leaders, please contact Southern Western University's Office of Development. Thank you. Joe, before you respond to um, what Steve had to say, uh, we are getting all kinds of great comments in the chat room. Some are saying this is one of the best uh, podcasts that we've done. And I think, you know, for Wesleyans, I mean, this this yes. is huge. I think that we have really struggled 
uh, I mean, I pastored for 14 years, really struggled at this, you know, this doctrine and our emphasis within our own denomination. Um, we do have another question out of the chat room. Why, why don't, I just want you to respond to what Steve said, see what you think there, and then we'll b- raise this other question. Yeah, I think Steve's point had to do with the class meeting yeah. and the importance of the class meeting to, uh, to Wesley's movement. And I, I would want to say, uh, first of all, yes. Um, the great, if I recall how this goes, um, George Whitfield was a famous preacher with electric uh, power over audiences and thousands and thousands of converts who, who preached in parallel with John Wesley. Both yep. men had huge movements. Um, it is it is said that uh, that uh, years after their preaching had reached its crescendo, Wesley had a whole movement, and Whitfield had nothing. And Whitfield's comment was that his converts were like a rope of sand; yeah. they were in and they were gone. Right. And uh, the difference, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, strategically was that Wesley put his people in class meetings and and bands and societies. They had very intensive spiritual in, encounter and engagement with each other and um, this was the seedbed for the movement as it rolled forward and just swelled to huge numbers. Now having said that, here's my fear my fear is that all of us who are functional and efficiency minded are going to say, oh, the class meeting, that's the way to go, a la small groups, accountability groups, we'll get that rolling. Let's not mistake a helpful strategy for the substance of Wesley's theological vision of who God is and what we are to become. Right. Love. God is love, and we are to become people infused with God's love so that then we can live God's love. And I, I'm just scared to death. We're, we're, you know, it's already been done. There are books out there, how to replicate Wesley's small groups and bands and societies, etc. And it's, 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 like, uh, it's like failing to see that at the very heart of it was a vision of God that made all the difference. But, but Joe, so, again... Go ahead. Yeah, let me interrupt here and say this. I mean, isn't this always isn't this always the rub? It, it, it there's always this need to have to systematize things. I mean, even in the church, working at the district level, one of the challenges is we say that spiritual formation is important, and yet. How do you put that on a form? Yeah. What does that look like yeah. as you're trying to emphasize that in the life of pastors? And so, um, and that Tony is where is where exactly where Phoebe Palmer, in my opinion, hurt us, because she wanted to make. Uh, here, here, I'm, I'm, I'm commenting on a saintly woman who had <laughs> far more effect than I will ever have. <laughs> uh, Thanks for the disclaimer there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Goes, you know? <laughs> right. Here it goes. She Americanized it in the sense, and I, I, here I'm speaking very, very broadly. Sure. She made it measurable. Yeah. She made it immediate. She made it a Walmart experience. Oh. I can go in. I can buy it. I can know I have it. I can walk out. I have the receipt. Oh. I know it's here. Oh man. Okay. Mm. Now, that's not how the that's not how the class meetings were. People were seeking holiness or seeking the love of God, seeking to become people who were infused with God's love. Uh, Wesley's famous uh, description of a man who's been dying and dying and dying for some time, and then at some moment, you know, he, he has to die because death and life don't mix together, and there's an instantaneous transition that takes place when you move from uh, life to death, you know? That was the argument, that was the, the notion brought forward. Um, yes, Wesley said those exact words pretty much, but he used them in a completely different sense. What he said was, a person, a, ma- a man may be dying for a long time, and then at some point later, we encounter him and we know he's stone cold dead. We can infer that there must have been some point in there where that happened, some instant where that happened, mm. but we may never know when it was. Yeah. Mm. We may never know when it happened. It's the identifiability to us 
of the moment is completely wow. beside yeah. the point for Wesley. Yeah. He was operating a deeper theological analysis. So, again, what I would say is that what, what Palmer did was to make this much easier, much more marketable, much more, um, uh, the, the short way, as it's often been called, in my opinion, is not simply the short way of a longer way, as Wesley's view has sometimes been called. The short way and the long way are two completely different visions yeah. that have a different mechanism of their operation, a different expectation, a different way of knowing what has happened, and even a different goal for it. For Wesley, it was being remade in the image of God, which is love. Which is love. Yeah, good distinction. Um, Joe, we, we've been very blessed at our church the last couple of weeks to have a, a lot of baptisms, and some of those were people who had uh, gotten baptized at a young age and just was, I think for them, it, they have experienced sanctification anew in these last few months and, and didn't know another, they wanted to express that through baptism. I, my question is, uh, you know, on our reports, we got a place for salvations and baptisms, and you can you can measure those. I know how many people I put under the water Sunday, but there's also a place there for sanctifications, mm -hmm. and I'm oh, asking, boy. is there... As people are going through this process, what is a way to celebrate that? And, I mean, when I was filling out, you know, we do a weekly report, and I put five sanctifications. They didn't come to me. They didn't fill out a card. But I can look at their life, and I see a difference, and none of us can explain it. When I filled out my year report, I said, sanctifications. Did we have any sanctifications? I said, oh, yeah, me. And it wasn't anything I did. It was something that God did for me, in me. Uh, so I guess my, my question is, how do we, this is such an important view of our heritage, of this being filled with God's love, how do we how do we celebrate that more and point people toward perfect love in a way that doesn't cheapen it, I guess? Yeah. Uh, and without having to put the notches on the gun belt. Right, that, that's, yes. That's the... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think one thing we need to be careful to do is not to denigrate the wonderful reality of the new birth. Yeah. But this is often what happens, and that is that in a generalized, generally Christianized culture, lots of people are cultural Christians, and when they come to meet the living, loving God, a, a huge change happens to them. Well, what, what, what happened? What, where do we put that? Mm. And I think that, that, uh, this that that a, a a major change from death to life and from not knowing God to knowing God and actually a major encounter with the love of God that is new birth that is new birth mm. and so what I what I would not want to do is to do what has often happened in the Wesleyan Holiness movement is that every good Every major, every every example of a major shift in somebody's life becomes, oh, that was their entire sanctification. Right. I think a lot of times uh, people have only been Christian in a kind of casual, cultural way. Mm. They may even have been baptized. My question would be, were they ever even truly born again? Yeah. And and uh, and and given God's spirit, uh, and and brought over from you know Colossians one, brought over from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That's a massive, major, huge shift in in a human being's experience and life, and that ought to be visible and obvious. What we're speaking of now, when we talk about uh, being made perfect in love is a fuller infusion <clears throat> and a fuller experience of the amazing, uh, overly abounding reality of God's love, known not simply in a conceptual way, but sunk down to the very core of who I am, mm. so that I call myself and know myself to be beloved. And I think what Wesley would say is that the fruit of this is not just a, you might say, um, 
a flash or a burst of awareness of God, but a, a full surging kind of opening of the very deepest uh, uh, parts of who we are, so that we, 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 we find ourselves amazingly changed at a deep affectional level, that is, at a deep level of our basic um, aversions and our basic uh, inclinations. And we find ourselves truly reaching out in a heart of love to all human beings of every kind, even people who hate us, even people who are <clears throat> troublesome to us, every kind of person, and not in a selective way. Here's where I, I, I am concerned about the tendency we all have to, to name a project that we're involved in. Oh, I'm involved with pregnancy crisis, I'm involved with feeding the homeless, I'm involved with youth who are in uh, crisis, uh, I'm involved with helping prostitutes out of prostitution, uh, slave trafficking, etc. There are a thousand and one um, selective, precise, you might say, rescue efforts that we may take upon ourselves and actually be very deeply involved with and actually feel very much about. But that's, and that's great, that's good. That's a good thing to be doing. However, that's not necessarily the visitation of God's love that breaks us up in such a way that we are poured out in love across the board, not selectively. Mm -hmm. And it means not only special project folk, it means the people that I, that I find very troublesome and threatening to me. Um, I could go on and on. But yeah, I was going to say, we we're, 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 we're have to leave it at that, Joe. It's incredible right. here. We, it seems like we've been talking about 10 minutes, but, I mean, the hour is just gone. Yeah. Um, uh, what our listeners don't know is I promised you we'd, we'd be done with you in 30 minutes. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just blew right through our promise. Um, I understand in a previous conversation with you that when you take your next sabbatical, this is actually an area that you're going to be writing on. Is that right? Right. God willing, pray okay. for me. Okay, so you have to, so uh, you have to promise to come on our show, right? When you release, we want exclusive rights. That's right. The first interview. <laughs> uh, listen, thanks so much. Thanks so mm, much for taking. This has been so good and very helpful, and uh, we just cheer you on, Joe. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, would love, love, love to see this in written form. Great discussion in the chat room, Joe. Just, just you. A lot of wow moments for people today, so thank you so much. All right. Hey, listen, we'll see you in July at, at our district conference, Joe. Good deal. All right. Talk to you then. Bye-bye. All right. Let's quick zoom to our giveaway. Uh, we have uh, their book right here, Discovering Evangelical Herod Heritage. Evangelical, and Evangelical <laughs> Heritage. And it's been signed by Don <laughs> Dayton. So who's our winner? Our winner is Keith Kuyper. Keith Kuyper, Kuyper. first-time entrant. Uh, we had a lot of entries. Went Entrant. Back. I think you invented a word just like Joe did. Entrant? That's a word. <laughs> I don't know. Listen, it don't is. try to just, just thesauricize my, me. My, my ignorance. My <laughs> this is psych games. Okay. So <laughs> Keith Kuyper will be sending you a a <laughs> message. And uh, Yep, just give us your address. We'll get that out today. Doing that right now. All right. Uh, let me tell you what's coming up here in the future. Um, next week we have Cher Sheets. She is in, uh, has launched a ministry called Just Embrace. She works in the inner city of Chicago. Um, on June the 27th, Mark Waltz will be with us. He is the author of uh, three books, First Impressions, Creating Wow Experiences in Your Church, Last Impressions, From Visiting to Belonging, and how to Wow Your Church Guests, 101 Ways to Make a Meaningful First Impression. And uh, Heath's going to be gone on vacation that week, but in studio we will have Beth Peterson. She put me on to Mark's book, and so she's going to help me conduct the interview, and looking forward to having her in studio that yeah. week. All righty. Uh, let's see here. Anything else before we wrap up? I don't think so. I just can't believe how quickly this happened today. Like, yeah. I feel like something weird is 
some kind of time vortex. Yeah, right? or in, men in black time, right? Uh, well, <laughs> Doctor Who time. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I think for Westlands, this is of particular interest, um, you know, the whole doctrine of entire sanctification and, and how we understand it and present it to our people. All right. Well, if you want to do further research on anything we discussed today, please check us out at our website, thetechnologyshow.com. There's so much content there from General oh Conference. My, yeah. Every every session is there. I counted it up. I produced oh, somewhere over 40 posts in those four days. So that's 10 a day of just some quality interviews and things that happened during that. So hours and hours and hours. Yeah, you, got, you can waste a lot of time on our website these Take days. Waste? Yeah, if you have any questions concerning today's interview or anything we've posted, you can send us an email at the technology show at gmail.com or better yet, why don't you leave us a voicemail by calling us at 3049theology. That's 304-986-5649. Leave us a message. We may even play your comments right here. Yeah, if you've got questions, yeah, if you've got questions for uh, next week's guests about uh, uh, missions in Chicago, leave us a message and that will get played. All right. Um, let's see. Where, uh, Heath, we where can our listeners find you? <laughs> hey, they can find me at HeathMullican.com. I have merged all of my blogs into one and unexpectedly sent 400 emails out to all my blog subscribers, so I apologize for that. But we're all in one place. Chase Your Line right. is now under Heath Mulligan. So Steve, where you. can people find you these days? They can find me at your house Friday night for That's a little right. get-together. There we go. But also, uh, PastorSES at gmail.com. All right. Yeah, uh, for me. Wow. You can find me at MatthewTG.com. All right. You can find me at Facebook.com forward slash AKC64. As always, thanks for joining us, everybody. Goodbye. Adios. And thanks to Southern Wesleyan University. That's right. Thank you, Southern Wesleyan. <coughs> Sayonara. <coughs>